This is Gene Adam, former lead singer of Iced Earth. Be sure to subscribe to Podcast in Stone. And don't forget, join our community on social media. Metal lives. Hello, this is Randall from X Iced Earth, and welcome to Podcast in Stone. People of the Iced Earth community, welcome to Podcast in Stone, the only podcast 100% dedicated to Iced Mother Fucking Earth. Today, another special episode for you guys, because we know you all like special episodes. Today, Myself and my co-host Chuck Hoskins are joined by the OG, the motherfucking OG lead guitarist of Ice Surf. Please welcome Randall Shulver. Hello, sir. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you guys doing? We are doing great, Randall. Thank you. Can't complain. Thank you for inviting me on here. I appreciate it. Appreciate the work you guys do. Well, it means a lot to have us on here or have you on here. Um, Thank you. I'll go ahead and start us off, Jason. Uh, one of the first things we want to ask you about is who is your early influences and uh, who introduced you to music and who wanted to make you pick up the guitar? When I was uh, about five or six years old, my dad played guitar a little bit, and uh, so I was fascinated with it. And then uh, they ended up getting me one of them little four-string toy guitars, right? And I I played it a little bit. I think I learned a lick or two, but then I found it um, broken in half under my bed one day. I think my brother didn't like my playing very well. (laughs) So it was broken, and I didn't didn't start playing again until I was like 13, and I started taking lessons. um, And I went to a local person there in Polk County, and he just had uh, this method of trying to teach people the – nashville chord chart guitar shit where you can go in and record uh like in nashville um sessions and i got bored with that real quick man and i I only took lessons for a couple months um after that i went probably when i was 16 is when i really started playing you know seriously and i would just go from one thing to another uh doing ear training um learning other people's music writing my own and uh, taking lessons from various people. I went to uh, Randy Farrell. He was in the Bellamy Brothers. And for being in a country band, he's a damn good guitarist, man. He's really good. He's got that perfect pitch where he, if he hears a chord, he can tell you what key it's in. So I'd be like, I'm trying to learn this part in Free Will Burning from uh, <laughs> Judas Priest. And he'd just start naming off the chords as they were playing. He didn't even have to pick up his guitar. He'd just say, B-flat. G A C, you know, and he, I would just go to that position and he was right on it. So after that, I went to a private instructor at Florida Southern College, a classical guitarist, and I went there for like a year and a half, I guess, taking private lessons. But I, I never stuck with one thing for too long where I would just, I never really wanted to read music and be a classical guitarist. I just wanted to study a little bit from as many, you know, avenues as I could to try and pick up a little bit of a different style that I could add to mine, you know, basically. Who were you listening to at that point? Well, in the late 70s, I mean, I'd go to the Kiss concerts or Judas Priest or Nazareth, shit like that. But when I started playing, I guess it was um, probably 1981, so I was listening to um overkill and um what the hell's the other bands ah crap the, maiden, the speed of, well i was always listening to maiden and priest and you know and um sabbath you know but when the heavier shit came out like overkill and then slayer and the first metallica and shit like that i was heavily into the thrash speed metal stuff at the time and i still love nice. it but yeah <laughs> um i have a, I, i'm gonna move on from that point uh how All did right. you how did you uh come to meet john gene and the guys from purgatory slash iced earth uh and and was the band called purgatory when you joined them yeah the band was called purgatory when i joined them i actually had met them prior to joining the band because there was a club called the sunset on 
I think Fletcher in Tampa, a little shithole dive, but that's where the metal happened. And um, we went over there to, to party after the club closed one night. And I think John and Greg and the other guys are there and Bill. And um, we ended up partying with them and then we left. But I, I didn't know I'd be coming back and meeting, you know, John later. But uh, I had tried to look for bands in in the area and in Central Florida, man. I couldn't find shit. You know, because everybody wanted to do either death metal or, you know, mellow or shit. And I wanted to do the thrash speed metal type stuff. So me and Mike McGill, the drummer, was going to save up money. And I wanted to go to New York. I wanted to move up there and find something at the time, you know, because it just seemed like it was dead avenue in Tampa. And um, right before I left, uh, my... My parents and my brother, they used to go to Thoroughbred Music sometimes, and they picked an ad off the wall. And my mom said, before you go, just try this number because somebody's looking for a band. That's when I called John. And um, I went over there with my demo and listened to his, and, you know, we hit it off. It, You know, my stuff was a lot more complicated, triplet-picking, fast, speed metal-type stuff, where his was more in, like, the Sabbath um, you know, a little bit doomy, but um, mid tempo and and just classic metal riffs. You know, didn't really have any triplet picking or speed or thrash in the style at the time, like I did. So I thought to myself, um, I don't want to play the mellow stuff. I want to play the speed stuff. But I I think it would be good to mix his style and mine together, and it would be more, you know something that would be cooler than either me just doing total out thrash beat all the time and him doing the classic metal stuff. Right. So that's what I thought at the time. It would be a good mix. Well, what were your thoughts when the band switched uh, names to Iced Earth? Were you happy or do you remember what your thoughts were? Um, I don't know, man. It was kind of weird at first. But the band was named Purgatory 60, I think, to begin with. And I, that was kind of strange, too, I think. So I understood why he did it, because it was after one of his friends that passed away. So it ended up being a good decision. At the time, I just didn't know if I liked the title or not. You know, it's kind of half and half on it, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> can't, can't, can't get away from the name there, can you? <laughs> no, 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 it's fine. <laughs> Just any new name when a band changes is kind of strange, you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. As you as you joined the band, you moved on to uh, uh, record the Into the Realm demo, which uh, I have a copy of because I'm a lucky motherfucker. All right. <laughs> My holy grail. That's the original, man. My is it still grail. shrink wrapped? No, unfortunately, I got it off the uh. second hand market, so it's not it's not shrink wrapped. But uh, it's in good nick though. I got it sub one hundred dollars, so I got it really cheap as well. <laughs> Feel free to double copy, man, so it doesn't get ruined. We won't sue you, man. <laughs> well, John might. John might. You never know. <laughs> yeah, I was. Uh, I was uh, wondering um, when you went in to record this, and you actually got this all recorded and stuff. Did you expect to get the success that you got from the back of this, getting signed by Century and stuff like that? Did you even expect the length of the, uh, the successes this actually came with? I, I was hoping it would, you know, but nobody ever knows. It's just um, we put a lot of work into that. When I first joined Iced Earth, they had probably 10 or 12 songs that were, you know, like on their the horror show demo. There wasn't really any speed or thrash or anything like that. It was just, you know, good, you know, good metal. But after um, two years, we ended up, building it up to about 35 songs. And then we had probably 15 that we thought were the best. And, and we thought about it. We're like, you know, we could make these songs better. We, we just need to break up these 35 songs and turn them into the best ones that we can. So we ended up consolidating them down to about 15 tunes. And then the 10 best were selected. And then I think we whatever we picked were the best out of those 10 to go into the studio with. And that's when Enter the Realm was done. So, 
I have a question about Enter the Realm. Mm-hmm. Why wasn't Nightmares on the debut? Fucking great song. Why was it on the debut? What? Hmm. Oh, I don't know, man. Oh, nobody I don't knows. even... I don't remember. <laughs> I just I always liked the wacky lead on the beginning, but... Because everybody thought it was a harmonizer, but it's just me playing harmonies on it. I never used a harmonizer on anything. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, back from here. Um... I have a, I'm gonna go move, move quite ahead to the Burnt Offerings album a second. Yeah. Uh, we we had a quite a lengthy conversation with John about that album, and you know, he he goes into deep depth of his uh, distaste, uh, disliking for the album. How it brings up brings up bad memories of that time period. Uh, what what was your kind of what's your take on that era of the band and the actual time when it came to actually putting that record together? Well, I mean, I love the first seven years being in the band. I'll I'll tell you that right now. I loved it because we were going in and we were doing very technical, thrash, speedy stuff mixed in with the other stuff, and I loved doing that, man. I loved writing my parts and going in and doing the solos and coming up with all the harmonies and melodies and all that shit. I mean, that would keep me busy, man. And um, by the time we got to burn offerings, I mean, yeah, we had a bad time, three-year layoff, and we even talked about flying out to California, me and John, buying a couple baseball bats and fucking up the record company guy because he wouldn't give the fucking money to us, you know? <laughs> yeah, they wouldn't, you know, and that, that was a serious conversation, but we didn't do it. You know, I'm glad we didn't, but <laughs> that um, was the kind of thought process everybody was in because – you know, when you work that hard for so many years, you want to at least get compensated somewhat for it. You know, and right. at that time, the only people getting compensated for it was a record company. And the shitty, the shitty deal we signed, you know, you get whatever percentage, but all the costs come out of your percentage. So you basically owe in the record company more than um, was brought in because you have such a shitty contract, even though they've made. 85% of the profit and they're profiting you still owe them money you know and um but I, I love that record man I think it's probably the most atmospheric heaviest album Iced Earth ever did and um if I was going across like the River Styx with Sharon and they had a boombox by hell I would think you know the <laughs> Halloween theme would be on with one of them you know or Slayer, Rain and Blood, or, <laughs> or some of this shit off of Burn Offerings could be on there too, man. That's it's just had that atmosphere of dark evil, and that wasn't fake, man. Everybody was feeling that at the time, and you can't fake that in the studio, man. It just comes out on the record, so that's why I love it. It's pure, you know. Right. Yeah, man. Like we, me, me and Chuck, we've already done there. Uh... We've already really done an extensive episode on that album, and we we both agreed that out of the whole Ice Earth catalog, from like you know the debut until Incorruptible to their recent one, um, Burnt Offering stands out as not I, I want to say anomaly, but that's the wrong word to use if you know what I mean. It stands out because it's got a sound like the rest of the catalog has got a you know it's you know it's Ice Earth by it's got that underping sound. Burnt Offering has got such yeah. a such a nasty fucking angry heavy off you know <laughs> heavy sound it's so it's just the envelopes in darkness sure that it's, it sounds like not like there's there's no other band that sounds like it you know like uh, uh somebody on that group actually said oh if, if you put this if you put burnt offerings up against a death metal record of that time period it's as heavy as a death metal record it's that it's so heavy like it just that, has that different op- vocals that, that opening yeah. chord on Burnt Offerings, that just like, da, 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 it's fucking, oh, it's so heavy, it's so good. And that's what I think John forgets. I mean, he was going to be, a, he's a planner, so he wants to plan and go in and make everything meticulous. That was just more of an emotional record, get in there and fucking do it and don't think about it. And that's why it came out like that. You know, it's all emotion, you know, there's no faking it, you know. It's like if you see Tom Cruise getting angry in a movie, he's acting. If you see Sam Jackson in a movie acting, he's not. He's really fucking pissed off. 
<laughs> you, you, if, if you fake, you can't fake that kind of shit in the studio either, man. It just came out because that's how we felt at the if, time, you know. If you see Jeff Goldberg in a movie, <laughs> they've just happened. It's just him being himself. They just happened to film it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's what I think. I think it's one of the best records, and I think it's definitely the most atmospheric and dark and heaviest one that Iced Earth ever did. Sure. Sure. Uh, and there's a there's a lot there's a lot of fans uh, that we we speak to that hold that in a you know in a really special place in their hearts and stuff you know that like sure. change their lives like you know so many people speak highly of that record and mm-hmm. it's it deserves it because it's fantastic uh speaking I'm, of uh, sorry go, go ahead go on, go on. No, i was gonna say it may not be the best content on the record you know there may it may not be the best songwriting but it just has that feel you know that's why i always love that it. it's authentic to me but sorry to interrupt you go ahead that's right, man. Man. I was going to say, uh, speaking of uh, Burnt Offerings, uh, by that point, uh, the band had brought in Matt Barlow uh, on vocals. He would be the band's third official singer. Um, how, how was that? What was that like to get your head around, like, you know, three albums, three singers? Because that's kind of unheard of these days, you know, like, especially maybe even back then it was quite unheard of to have a, such a rapid succession of singers in such a short period of time. Or was I don't know, man. I didn't really think about it. <laughs> I never really paid attention to the lyrics or vocals that much because I was just concentrating on guitar. Even when I listen to music now, I'm usually listening to the guitars and not to um, what the vocals are like a typical fan would, I I guess, because I play guitar, you know. I I don't know, man. It, It probably doesn't seem wise to change a lineup every album, you know, because people get used to certain things and they want to hear it for a while. But, um... If I were to buy like Maiden Number of the Beast, which I've probably bought ten times, I want to get the original album with the original artwork and the original musicians. I don't want to have one musician on it and four guys playing cover tunes, you know. I can go see that in a bar, you know. So things that I love like that, I want to hear the originals. I don't really want to hear a lot of changes in it. That's fair enough, man. That's fair. What are your thoughts on the uh, the different album covers for the first three hour, first three albums? Do you have favorites, or do you have any that you don't like? Well, the Storm Rider one with the guy and the horse, I always love that one. The one that they put with the um, the um, ape guy on a lizard, though, that one sucked. Yeah. <laughs> oh, 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 wait, 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 wait. You, you mean that one, right? You mean that yeah, one? I hated that one, man. I hated that album cover. Yeah. Yeah, classic. Classic, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I love that one. I got That's it sealed. Cool. Sealed on cassette, man. Awesome, man. <laughs> I've got all the cassettes. I'm an obsessive fan with everything. Did you show you showed him your Vampire of the Horse artwork? <laughs> yeah. Oh, fuck yeah. Yeah, mine signed. When did that come? Did oh, that yeah. Come? I remember that one, too. That's terrible. That's awesome. It's kind of it's kind of classic <laughs> metal though. <laughs> yeah. It, it dates the time period. Storm Rider? Was that Storm yeah. Rider? Oh, okay, man. Yeah. Smoking my uh, so, electronic cigarette. <laughs> so, what was it like being a, a you know a young musician? What was the culture shock going overseas a lot like I Earth did in the early days? What was your, how was it for you to make the, those adjustments to go overseas? Um, I mean, the first couple of tours, it was great because that's a new experience. You know, you get to meet everybody and you're, um, you don't have to work, you know, or worry about getting up. Just do your show, party afterwards a little bit, and then get on the bus before it leaves your ass, you know? <laughs> <laughs> But the first tour with uh, Blind Guardian, we partied so fucking hard, man, that when we came back and did the second tour, we had to get two buses, one for the party years and one for the non-party years. That way, if you felt like drinking, you could get on that bus. If you felt like resting, you could get on on the fucking other one. So, (laughs) Thinking ahead, that's good. That's that's clever. But going over there was great, man. It it was... um, It was good to, to meet fans in a lot of different countries, especially, you know. Was there um was there ever a moment where like you know you you know you'd be on stage you're looking out to the crowd you're looking at your guitar and you think to yourself 
this is fucking awesome. Was there like, do you ever remember like a specific, <laughs> specific moment like that? Oh yeah, man. There's moments like that, and we played in Greece, you know, and there was like 1,500 people. But I, I think that's the largest show I played to at that point. I'm not really sure what they played to after, but it would be great to see 40, 50,000 people out there. That would be awesome. But yeah, man, their fans are always cool, man, and they're they're into it. It 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 may even um, guide them in their life a little bit, you know, just by hearing the music and the messages and keeping them out of trouble right. by being there at the concert. You know? <laughs> I don't know. Nowadays, uh, people like to get in trouble at concerts. You know? <laughs> We've got people that like to beat up people at concerts. Oh, where's that happening at? I don't know, it's just like, I, I went to this death metal concert the other week, and there's there's these there's these moshers that we call crowd killers. They oh, spin yeah. their arms around, I'm like, what the fuck are you doing? Get out of the concert, fuck you. Like, <laughs> they, they, ruin, they ruin it for everyone, because yeah, you can't just mosh like you would normally, like to a really heavy band, or just get or just be at the front head banging. You're going to have to always watch around, make sure you're not going to get punched in the face by a crazy fucking uh, yeah. crowd killer, whatever, you know. Uh, I'm hardcore dancing. No, you're not. You're looking like a twat. Fuck off. <laughs> that, you know? Well, you can't have guns in the UK, but you can carry a machete, right? Uh, I do believe uh, <laughs> you still can get arrested for that as well. <laughs> trust, me, right. I could, trust me, if I could take a machete to a gig, a lot of these people would have no arms left. Oh, you don't even have to swing it. You can just hold it up and wait for them to swing their arm at you. <laughs> it's not your fault. You don't get just, charged with just, it. Just swing away. <laughs> they, they tried to arrest me. I go, look, I didn't do anything. I just stood there. They, they fucking, yeah. they, they waited for it themselves. <laughs> <laughs> that would work. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're, when, we're do, when doing the live shows, were there any songs that were – like your favorites that you did or was it all pretty much just, you know, a show? I just like doing the things off the first three records because they were challenging, you know, to play. Um, I, I like playing complicated, technical, triplet picking, you know, tempo changing metal, you know. I didn't like the time we got to Dark Saga. I didn't, I mean, even though it's a good record, I just didn't like playing it. Man. It would just bored me. You know, I got bored with that record real quick. Man. So that, that's just being honest, man. Good music, but it was boring playing it. That's fair, man. You know, I was speaking to Gene yesterday. You know, you know I said to him like, you know, you've 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 got to do uh, you've got to do what what you know what feels right for you. You know what I mean? It's like that like I play drums, and if I'm not feeling, if I'm not feeling it, and I'm not feeling that groove. I'm not enjoying myself. Do you know what I mean? So I, I can understand that as well. So it's just hard to go from that t level of technical playing, you know, to just the mellow, you know, almost commercial rock stuff. You know, it's just a big change, man. Maybe now I, w I wouldn't have cared, but or if the deal with um, Todd McFarlane had gone through, I probably wouldn't have cared because that had the ability to take us to the next level. Yeah, we just heard about that. That was so disappointing that that could have been a lot bigger for you guys. And that really killed me, man. I was like, fuck, you know, is this going to be a job for me or is this just going to continue to be a hobby? And, you know, you got to ask yourself a question. Are you going to make enough money doing this to be a career or not? And if not, it's just a hobby. It's not a job, you know. So eventually I had to ask myself that and I wasn't making enough to live off of. And if that would have went through, who knows what would have happened. But that pretty much killed it for me, man. I was just tired of the whole industry at that point. Is, um, is that... Is that, would you say that's what kind of led you to your exit from the band? Well, it kind of started before that when we were doing um, Burn Offerings. Um, the first two albums, I loved it, do, doing it, man. And, and it was a very good band atmosphere for Ice, Earth, and Storm Rider. We were all had the same goals. Everybody was working hard. You know, after Storm Rider, John, um, he was he didn't even want to do music anymore, man. He started taking up judo or karate lessons.
lessons like he didn't want to even be in music anymore because he didn't make shit at the time nobody did nobody made any money and um after two and a half years of not doing anything we finally got burnt offerings together but i don't know it just seemed like everything changed in that time it wasn't a, a positive atmosphere anymore it was just like um just go through the motions you know to get get this record done and even though it came out angrily, so maybe that was good for the record, burnt offerings, because it, it showed the anger and shit that was uh, there at the time. But then after that, um, I understood why we were doing the Dark Saga thing, because it did have a chance to take us to a better commercial success in America. You know, if we're on the first rung of the ladder, this might take us up to the third. And if you get a a song in an action figure that's selling 400,000 copies, then you're going to be number one on their singles chart because most of them only sell 70 or 80,000 copies. So you're going to be number one. And even if a couple hundred thousand people go out and buy the record, then that's going to bring you the attention of the bigger record companies. Or you would at least get on some good tours where you could make some decent money. Right. And when, when the, um, the guy, I'm not going to say his name because he's passed away now, ruined that deal. Yeah, that sucked, man, big time. And so I, I was like, I don't, I didn't think Iced Earth was going to get any bigger or get to the next level where you're selling eight to 10,000 seat halls out where I could actually make a living, you know, off of it. So I, I just decided, you know, it's probably good to move on anyways, you know. That's fair, man. You know, you've got to do. You know, your life obviously you've got to think of yourself sometimes. You know, we're we're all in it for ourselves. At the end of the day, to think about it. We all got our own lives. We all got bills to pay. Well, there's a brother. There is a brotherhood to a oh, degree, yeah. but you got to yeah. eat, man. You got to yeah, pay yeah. your rent. I understand that. <laughs> and, and by then, I had my neck so screwed up, and there's no way the band was going to pay for it, man. I had to find work where I had insurance where I could get my neck fixed. You know. So that was another major reason, man. My neck was fucked up, man. Now you I've, usually I've get... I've seen some YouTube... <laughs> What's that? I was going to say, I've seen some YouTube videos where you're just, just rocking out, and I can understand completely why you had neck issues. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but your disc and your neck's usually an oval. Mine look like two pine cones, man. Just all raggedy and shit, all split up. So I was like, I had to get... Get that surgery for it. It, t it takes about two years before you can even get to that point because they want 30 therapy sessions, a couple shots in your neck, and finally they give you the surgery. But and it, right. it's a lot better now, but there's no way I could have continued on anyways at that time, man. It was just in too much pain. Um, where do I want to go? Uh, can I jump to Days of Purgatory for seconds? Uh, they're, they're, <coughs> when Days of Purgatory, I know Day, Days of uh, I can't talk today. Days of Purgatory. Um, we spoke briefly to John about Days of Purgatory. He basically said, "I don't care about that as a filler album." That's basically John's opinion on Days of Purgatory. But because um, uh, I remember when, when when I bought that record, uh, and I heard obviously Matt doing the older stuff, there was one song that was new, which is Winter Nights. That was pretty much a new track, exclusive for that uh, package. Uh, do you know what the story is behind Winter Nights? Where that came um, from? Not really, man. No. no. I remember playing it a little bit, but I don't remember much about it. What were your thoughts when that came out? Were you uh, disappointed you were redoing those first two with uh, Matt on vocals, or did you have much of an opinion on it? I mean, I, I think it was probably a good idea to re-release those because you got a new singer coming in that um, the band was going to dedicate to the future with. So, and the first album was very meager budget, so it, it sounded like shit. But I, I'm of the opinion that I don't like to hear things change too much. When I go by, like I said, Number of the Beast, I don't want to get... I want the original... CD with the original artwork and the original musicians. That's what I fell in love with. I don't want to hear a new cover of it, you know. So I'm kind of half and half on it. I mean, I think it was good for Matt to 
record those songs to get them out there in front of the crowds. But I also like the original versions. You know, I like what Gene did on the first record, and I like what John did on the second record. You know, I think they they fit very well. Oh yeah, like, um, we 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 harp like you know about the first first two records like you know pro- they're they're a product of their time and uh, like they they've got that blueprint of like you know 80s thrash metal and like new wave of British heavy metal they're very rooted in their time and there's yeah. and there's a lot of people that I know that know are not like really that much fans of Ice Earth but they know Ice Earth. And they mm-hmm. talk a lot of shit about that first record with Gene and say, oh, Gene's terrible. I'm just like, Gene's, if you really give that album a listen, Gene fits so well in what the album was doing in my opinion. Sure. And Me just, too. Hell, just yesterday, I was listening to the debut album. Just I'm just like, this is fucking still, to this day, still killer. Man. Yeah, I like agree. That. I think he did a great job on the record. You know, he's his type of vocalist. You know, he sounds unique and it fit. So, I agree. And and, uh, and John Greedy as well, fantastic, fantastic vocal work on Stormrider. Yeah, he did a great job too, no doubt about it. That's that's, you know, that's that's one of the reasons why we can't start this podcast as well is because we feel there's certain people that have kind of been forgotten when it comes to the bands. You know, like I think Gene and yeah. John Greedy have been forgotten. No, when everyone brings up the singers of the bands, they always think of Stu Block, the new guy. Tim Owens and Matt Barlow. No one really brings up John Greeley or Gene Adam, and it's disappointing to me because I feel they deserve as much credit as the new, the, the the later guys, you know. Yeah, I mean everybody worked hard to get onto records, man. Nobody gave yeah. them the job and taught them or trained them. They earned that position, you know. So they deserve respect too, you know. So do you, man? And hey, Randall. Your lead stuff. <laughs> Thanks, man. Your lead stuff. Fantastic. I was going to say, Randall, I'll give you a little props. You're one of the reasons why we have this podcast. I was sitting around one oh. night watching a, uh, a Kiss podcast, and they had the uh, <laughs> their ex-guitarist, Bruce Kulick, was on there. Oh, and yeah. I was, I, was, I was brainstorming. I was like, why isn't nobody interviewing Randall? I said, <laughs> this needs to be heard. So you're kind of one of the reasons why podcasts and stone exist. Well, I so. appreciate that, man. I wish you guys luck with it. I hope you go on to bigger things too. Um, yeah. Shall we move on to some viewer questions, Chuck? Yeah. yeah. We, let's, uh, let's, let's hear them, Jason. We we let our community know on Facebook that we were talking to you today, so they've uh, everyone's chipped in with a few questions. So uh, here we go. Uh, John Baylor asks, "What do you think?" of the current iced earth i mean john's always been a good songwriter there's always going to be good material put out um i just don't i I don't really like the whole power metal operatic keyboard type music you know i never did i always liked the um you know the old speed metal thrash metal stuff that's what i loved when i first started playing i still love it so I, I don't really know, though, because I haven't sat down and listened to any Iced Earth records since I left the band, man. I haven't heard of a complete record. I haven't even listened to the old ones completely. You know, I'll just hear a song here now and then. And um, so the songs I've heard, they're cool. You know, I saw the one video they did. What was it? Um, I can't remember. Was it a full DVD or just the video? No, it was just a video on YouTube. I think with Stu screaming in the beginning. Then it oh, goes probably bump, dystopia. Bump. Yeah, that one. That was it. Yeah. That that's a cool song. It's a good song. But I, I haven't really heard any of their new stuff in detail, man. I always wondered as a fan, like after you leave a band, do, are you do you want to hear that first record after you left right away, or do you kind of just stay away from it? Like when something wicked came out, did you want to hear it? <laughs> Or did you just like, nah? At the time, man, I didn't really even think of music, man, because my neck was so screwed up. I I was just trying to think of how am I going to get this shit fixed. So I wasn't really paying attention to nothing anybody did, you know? What's the point, you know? (laughs) Too much stress, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Uh, 
Larry Kinnard asks, uh, what music projects, if any, are you currently involved in? I've been asked multiple times to, to do things. I, I, I created a demo, right, you know, not too long after I left Iced Earth, but my heart wasn't really into it. My neck was messed up, and it, it totally sucked, man. So I just shelved it. I didn't do anything with it. After Right when I was about to get my surgery, um, Tank, the guy that you guys heard Soul Crusher and a couple of the other tunes, mm-hmm. right? And yeah, I shared a, at least one on our group page. We were gonna, we were getting something together, man. But right before I was having my neck surgery, he had these guys in Orlando that won the lottery and they built their own studio. And I was gonna go up there and we were gonna do a record, but I, then they scheduled my neck surgery. So I had that, and then I was down for three months. I couldn't even leave the house for three months after I had the surgery. So that kind of fell through, and then um, after that, you know, I got to make a living, man. And starting over in music's not really going to pay anything. You know, it takes five or ten years just to get a foothold, you know. So I didn't really do anything there, but I always play at home, and I always record shit. As you can see the speakers in the back. You know, I've all, I always play and record. Maybe I'll do something again, but I just had to get in a more comfortable position financially before I can think about doing a hobby again. You know. Right. Uh, Adam Adam Ortiz asks, "What kind of guitars did you use in the studio and for live?" I believe in um, the beginning I had a Guild guitar and uh, Ibanez and then I ended up um, getting BC Rich guitars from them and I, I believe I used those in Stormrider and Burn Offerings but I generally it was BC Rich after the first record standard metal guitar I like it yeah well with EMGs in it yeah a, a Warlock with EMGs yeah how many guitars do you currently own? Well, I've still got the uh, BC Rich Warlock. I've got a uh, Takamini Acoustic, a, a classical guitar, two Les Pauls, um, a, a 200 watt Marshall Mono Block Amp, uh, Marshall Combo, uh, Orange Combo, uh, Avid 11 Rack, and a uh, Roland GR55 guitar synthesizer. That's pretty much nice. what I have now. Yeah. Uh, my mate, my <laughs> mate, my mate Philippe. I can't pronounce his surname because I'm terrible. But my friend Philippe asks, "What is your favorite Ice Earth song?" Hmm. That's a hard one. Um. Um. Shit, I don't know. It's kind of hard to say, man. But probably like Burn Offerings or Pure Evil. Nice. I would think. I would say your solo in Burn Offerings is my favorite solo on that album. That solo. Oh no, shit! Sure. <laughs> Fuck it. Uh-huh. Yeah. It just screams <laughs> in. It's so good. <laughs> no, thanks, man. I appreciate that. Uh, Steve Kane asks, "What is your favorite guitar?" My favorite guitar. Yes. I don't know, probably if I could have it, like a million dollar BC Rich full of um, gold. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. There's many guitars I've played, you know, ESPs, Les Pauls, uh, BC Riches. It, it, it's not really the brand. It's uh, the kind of pickups and electronics and shit like that that are in it and the, and the amps that you play through. So I don't really have a favorite guitar. Okay. I had a little... ESP that I took to the beach, man, until the neck broke, and that one sounded good through a little um, battery-powered um, portable Roland, yeah. Roland amp. Yeah, I just played them until they basically fell apart, man. And uh, <laughs> our, our, our final viewer, our final viewer question comes from you know who he is, David yeah. Bell. <laughs> David Bell. Uh, he says, uh, "Can Randy?" Uh, embellish on his opinions of our law law enforcement officials. Uh, he said, uh, "Can you I could, can you still ahead. can you uh, can you still pass out standing up with a beer in your hands?" 
uh, I early ice early <laughs> early ice surf uh, early ice yeah. surf is the best because of you. So yeah, that's what. Oh, well, thank you, Dave. I appreciate that, man. Because of you, also, bro. Um, I don't stand up and pass out with a beer much anymore because I've this is the first time I've had a couple beers in a while. I don't generally drink that much, but um, law enforcement. I mean, I think our country's getting taken over by people who don't honor the Constitution or the Bill of Rights, and hmm. uh, I support them when they go after people who create victims. You know, murderers, rapists, and all that, but most of their work is geared towards just extorting poor people nowadays. So, some of them need to be driven out. That's my opinion. Okay. Now, um, <laughs> me and uh, Jason are avid Iced Earth collectors, and we asked if uh, you had anything from your own collection that you'd like to show us today. Um, you mean uh, like CDs or something like that? Just uh, do you have anything that you you collect still, or that you is as personal or important to you? Well, a lot of stuff's online already. But if you guys did, you get the four uh, documents I sent you. I got them. Well, we can put them on our page. Okay. Also. Yeah, that would be good, man. Those are like uh, promos and things from the tour with Nevermore and the original flyer that we put out for Enter the Realm that we hung up around the city just a uh, flyer, you know? I don't know if you guys ever saw that. It's it's for the Enter the Realm demo that we put out in 1990. Okay. Yeah, I'll I'll um send them to Jason and we'll either put them on the the video backing or uh you know, add them to our page. Okay. Sounds good. I, Do I you have, uh I I have a cool little thing. Just maybe a what? Maybe a cool little thing, maybe set you down a memory road for a minute. All uh, right. Mike McGill was kind enough to send me a bunch of shit, a bunch of cool stuff like, you know, his drumsticks and stuff like that. But he sent me this. Oh, yeah, I got some of them too. That's fucking cool, man. Yeah. <laughs> and, he, and, and he signed it as well. So it's awesome. Yeah, I can do that too, man. If you guys want some stuff, just give me your address and I'll, you know, get um, it out to you. Like, it's you know, no you problem. Don't, you don't have to do that, man. Nobody has to send us stuff, please. Nobody has to. We appreciate it. We love you guys for it, but we, yeah, you know, never. It's never oh, necessary. No. <laughs> yeah, nobody has to, but I mean, I have the stuff laying around. I'd be happy to send you some stuff. I tell you no what, problem. man. Getting stuff from Mike McGill, though, uh, he's one of the he's one of my influences. The reason, one of the reasons I play drums. So. Oh, cool. You know, getting drumsticks signed by him and stuff like that, man. Mike, if you're watching, you are fucking awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that's cool, man. So who are you currently listening to? Do you – because I, I find that I listen to a lot of the same stuff I listened to when I was 16, you know, 15 years old. Who are you listening to these days? I mean, I, I always listen to all the old stuff that I loved, you know, Maiden Priest, Metallica, Slayer, um, Testament, shit like that. Also new shit there. There's some stuff I like, you know, like Five Finger Death Punch somewhat, uh, Volbeat. Event Sevenfold. I mean, I've I've learned a few of their songs. Okay. Because I I like them. So I mean, it varies, man. But I also learn classical music a lot too. Okay. So whatever I feel like well, I know, playing. I know. Uh, I've talked to Gene, and he said he's trying to get you to do maybe a couple acoustic numbers or something with him. And uh, just so you know, do there's it, a lot of people out there. That's, do that's, it. <laughs> Do There's a lot it, of people do that, it, that do hold it, those first four albums do it. <laughs> very special to them. And we, we'd love to see, you know, when, when we put on there that, you know, we were doing this interview with you, a lot of people's like, I haven't heard from Randall in forever. So mm -hmm. there's people that still care, man. We would love to see you and Gene get together and do a little acoustic number or two for us. Acoustic number about what? Like a just, new thing or just an old thing? He wanted to go do thing. some old cover of you know I yeah he, what it he's was. got a video of doing written on the walls yeah that's what he wanted to just, do just him yeah but uh it'd be great to see something like that of you again so uh, you never you know man care, buddy. we're having a meeting next weekend with uh, everybody the old band so i'll just see what happens that's cool man you never know i got enough you material know? probably to do 20 records anyway so <laughs> 
do it. Oh. Do it. <laughs> you guys should. You guys should definitely uh, take a picture of that. Then a lot of fans would love to see that. Random. Oh yeah, more more than likely. Yeah. I'm saying do it because I'm supporting John Greedy with his stuff. I'm supporting oh, okay. Gene Adam with his stuff. You, no, I'm uh, first customer right here, man. You put it out. All right. I'm gonna support it, man. Yeah. We'll see, man. If um. You know, if the right things happen and if there's a, a place to, to record and shit like that. I mean, I, I record at home, but it's not going to sound like a record. You know, it's going to sound like what you guys heard with Soul Crusher, you know. It's just on a... Yeah. I, re- I got some really good feedback on our page. That's a really, really cool track for sure. Cool, man. And that would be the mellow one. You know, I've got shit that's a lot heavier too, you know. Nice. What do you guys well, we, like? We, uh... You guys like the new Eister style power metal or the old one thrash metal? You know, I'll, I'll speak. And I'll let Jason take over after that. That's one thing that I love about Iced Earth is mm-hmm. when you have five different vocalists, you have, you know, different tones. You get almost like five different bands. Whereas, yeah. you know, if you if you have Slayer, you're going to hear the one, you know, or ACDC, you're going to hear kind of one tone, one sound all the time. I kind of like bits of all of it but, right. i mean storm rider storm rider is my favorite album of all time not just iced earth of, of all time so and you've heard all of the iced earth records i'm sure right every one of them and that's <laughs> many, your judgment many, many times. well yeah. i, I so like that's, that that's one too yeah. i'd say that's number two after well tied with burnt offerings to me is is storm rider and burnt offerings are the ones i like the best because that's what I like doing. That was my style back then, you know? Yeah. To me, the one, uh, Storm, Storm Rider's a perfect album. Just the tempo changes and the, it's just perfect. Thanks, man. I mean, I, I'm the, I don't even know if that would have existed if I didn't join the band because I'm the one that brought the thrash speed metal into it, man. If you listen to The Funeral on the first album, the first three minutes is my music, and then it goes into the... You know, the fast part? I love that song. I love that song. That's what I... That's the style I was playing years before I joined Iced Earth, man, and that's what we ended up gravitating towards, John Simple style and what I brought into it. And I would probably still be there if we played that longer, man, but it just totally changed with Dark Saga, you know? No, I just wasn't interested in that. So sorry, guys. Now for me, for me, you asked like Chuck's asked answered your question for me. Uh, uh-huh. I I I love it all. Obviously, I wouldn't be doing a podcast about a band if I didn't love it all. Uh, I don't know ever how you feel, but uh, something wicked this way comes is my favorite album of all time. Uh, to me, that's per that's a perfect album. But Storm Rider is like very close second. Storm Rider is also pretty much a perfect album. Yeah. Like, like, just to reiterate what Chuck was saying, really, like, I just feel the as as a career, as like a, a career of the band, I feel they have got so many different flavors that I feel it can cater to a lot of different people, and there's always that undercurrent that is undeniably the Ice Earth sound. Like, um, yeah, yeah, John, you know, John with his just kind of just gallop. Like, if if there's a gap in the <laughs> if if there's a gap in the music, there's gonna be a John just galloping, just randomly. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah, I'll tell you, like, you know, this demo, this, this is becoming one of my favorites as well. I fucking loved it. I think this demo sounds cool. better than the debut. Oh, the it demo, does, man, because there was... It sounds yeah. wicked. I think more money was spent on that demo than it was on the record, man. I don't, that's why I didn't understand why we didn't just use the songs that were on the demo and add to it. <laughs> right. Instead of doing them all over, but uh, who knows? <laughs> Yeah, man. Like, I just, I just think that I surf as a band, like from you know the evolution from what what they were to what they are now, is just there's there's something for you know there's something for every kind of metal fan there. You know, if you want your kind of softer moments, you've got stuff like Watching Over Me or For Summer Wicked or I Died For You of a Dark Saga. If you want the fucking, the, you know, your bowels vibrate with the heaviness, you go for something like Burnt Offerings. You know, you know stuff like that. It's, I just think there's so much variety. In the back yeah. catalog, that's what I love about it. It's just it's so varied, and, and that's to be expected over decades. You know, it's, things are going to change, man. But it just changed too fast for me, man. Back then, you know, we went from those three heavy, complex albums to a 
almost like a poppy, simple album, you know. That's fair enough, man. But that's just my opinion, man. No, I'm, 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 I'm only speaking as a fan, you know, like. Yeah. I didn't live it like you did, so. Well, the fans are what really counts, you know. Your opinions are what really counts, not mine. When it comes to the music, people like what they like. I'm not going to tell you what food to like. You know, you're going to like whatever it is you like. Same goes for music, you know. Are we, uh, are we all good to wrap up? I think we are. Um, yeah. Awesome. Everybody... Randall, we can't thank you enough for spending the day with us. Uh, it meant a lot to me personally as one of my guitar heroes to have you on here and spend a, an hour with you. It's been amazing for sure. Well, thank you, man. I appreciate that. And I appreciate you guys letting me come on here and talk, you know, stay in touch. We'd love to, we'd love to have you on again, maybe down the road and talk about some more stuff. Yeah. If we put together some music, I'm sure we'll have something new to talk about though. That'd be great. That'd be, that'd be fucking killer. Like, you know, for me, like again, like you know, thanks a lot for coming on. The first three albums were the first three albums I heard from the band, so they really kind of thrust me into the band. So, ah, oh, cool, man. Like I, I heard all your lead work first, and all the work you put in, I heard that all first. So, without those first awesome. first three albums, I wouldn't be a fan. So, it means a lot to me that you're on the show and we're having a chat today. So, yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, for yeah. man. Yeah, you're welcome, man. Thank you for liking the earlier stuff. I appreciate that, man. Thank you, everybody who's watched today. This has been our interview with Randall Shorva. He's awesome. Well, we, we all knew that anyway, so, you know, he's cool and stuff. <laughs> but, you know. Uh, yeah, thank, thank you for everybody that's uh, checked out the podcast, liked the videos, subscribed, joined the group. The group is an awesome place to be if you want to join like-minded iStir fans and discuss everything about the bands. I've been, I've been Jason. I've been joined by my co-host Chuck Hoskins, and we've been joined, of course, by the... Randall Shorver. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day. Bye-bye. All right, you guys take care. See you later.